I think we can get started here. Welcome to this session, um, which is called Why Contribute to Open Source? And it's about the strategic benefits of contributing to open source for both individuals and organizations. Um, it's great. There's a chat on the right um, hand side here. Uh, so do feel free to ask questions. I'll keep an eye out and try to either answer them as we go or save like the, the more meaty ones for the end. Uh, but I'd love for this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so let me get started. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the original motivations um, um, behind open source were very much intrinsic ones. Uh, people were scratching their own itch, itch and trying to solve um, their own problems, essentially. And it was uh, very much a hobbyist and hacker culture. And, you know, I'm talking like over two decades ago at this point, right? And the focus was um, very much on building tools for your own usage. I think the story around the invention of free software, uh, while well, the free software is a concept, ties into uh, a driver of a printer not working properly. Um, and so it, it's a very sort of like self-serving um, wanting to fix and having autonomy over our tools kind of culture. Um, and in the sharing um, uh, aspect, uh, reputation was the real currency. Um, and of course, you had the community aspects, right? Uh, what's also worth noting is practitioners were somewhat of a homogeneous group back then, um, very much centered around um, a tech uh, centers like Silicon Valley, uh, very white, very male, etc. What changed in two decades, or you know, close to that? Uh, well, a lot has. Well, first of all, we've seen a massive growth of tech. Uh, you've all heard, I'm sure, uh, the software is eating the world mantra, and uh, you know, it's follow up, which is open source is eating software, which is eating the world. And so we've seen like a massive adoption of, of, of tech everywhere, right? It's in, um, you know, in, 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 in machines and space and like it, it, it has blown up and it's everywhere. Um, and similarly, um, we've seen following that a massive adoption of open source. And obviously, um, you know, this has led um, to, to uh, a number of changes. And it's interesting to actually look at the journey that open source has taken um, uh, as it sort of ate its way into software. This is a, a great um, a graph ad ad adapted from um, uh, a slide by Nithya Ruff um, that sort of like walks um, uh, corporations through an open source journey. But, you know, it's, it's valid for sort of like industry-wise what happened, right? Um, it started with ignoring open source um, for a long time. Then finally, uh, corporations um, and, uh, you know, other players in the field started understanding that it was actually uh, software that could be used um, without having to pay, right? Free as in gratis. Um, and so they started consuming it. Um, as they started um, consuming that software and, and um, building it into the, their own software they were releasing or their, the products that they were releasing, uh, they had to start thinking about a compli compliance, right? Um, and bit by bit from compliance, uh, um, you know, started fixing uh, upstream and contributing back to software. And finally, sort of like only recently and only for a subset of um, players in the field, moving to really building a strong uh, open source culture. Um, you know, we can sort of translate these different steps to in sort of uh, layperson language. Uh, the ignore step was, well, you know, open source is for hippies. We're doing a real business here. So, like, we're not going to look into this. Um, consuming was more of like, yeah, open source is free and let's use it. Uh, moving to a compliance, you know, the, the reaction was, oh, there's a license. Well, let's get a lawyer here. Uh, and again, moving from a very sort of, uh, you know, moving up that that, that those step those that ladder those steps, again from a very um, sort of um, um, consumerist uh, perception of open source, um, you know, contributing was well. We're essentially, you know, uh, if, if we update that fix, we don't have to maintain a fork. So it's like it's better for us. Like we're the ones benefiting, right? Uh, 
And even in culture, when, when you move into adopting sort of like the open source model as a culture, uh, for example, in, in was inner source, um, it's also like, oh, well, it turns out that building software the open source way is actually pretty efficient. So let's do that too. So it, all of that is a very, um, um, you know, centric, um, uh, self-centric perception uh, and usage of open source, right? Which is kind of to be expected by corporations really, um, which are essentially there to, um, you know, be profitable. Um, so let's try to map that now into sort of the technology adoption lifecycle, right? If you're not familiar with this model, it's essentially a model where you, you see uh, how technology here, open source is adopted. Um, um, for example, like in a, in a given vertical in the industry, right? So at first you have the innovators, um, the 2.5%, which are actively working in the new mo in a, in a, in the new model and are really keen to see innovation and innovate. Um, quickly, uh, they will be followed by early adopters, which uh, you know, love new technology, get on board new technology really quickly, and then you have the early majority um, and the late majority, and finally the laggards. So if we go back to a graphic. Uh, think of those steps and think about the different steps to one where we're consuming. We see data today that says that's the um, OSRA report. That's a report from Black Duck, which is a company that um, audits um, software during merge and acquisitions to see if there are open source um, licenses uh, to be accounted for in the software that's being purchased as part of, of the acquisition. And in 2019, so this is that was for the um, financial um, services vertical, but it's sort of like similar numbers for every uh, vertical. But there was open source software in uh, financial services, 100% of acquisitions in 2019. And I think across industries, it was 96%. So basically, that's like, you know, it's, it's beyond mainstream, right? Um, so, you know, you can use compliance as a way to, um, a proxy for actually being used in products. So today, still in the financial services industry, uh, there is 73% of companies are actually, um, you know, have set up systems to comply with their open source usage in products, right? Um, and that is, you know, for um, over half, it is like a common thing. Right. So again, you know, that level of like understanding compliance in, in, in the industry uh, is widely different from what um, it was a few decades ago, where you know, companies like Microsoft, you know, um, uh, would call uh, Linux a cancer. Right. Whereas today there are like uh, huge proponents of open source. So you really see uh, you know, this this um, change in perception and usage and adoption of open source over those um, um, years. Looking at contributing to open source still in that financial services vertical, uh, you'll see that, well, there in like the, we're very much in the sort of like early adopters, uh, even, you know, half of like early majority uh, kind of situation here, right? And that is for uh, financial services. If we look in tech, right? We said that number increases quite a bit. So tech companies, well, obviously tend to contribute a lot more to open source, right? But we're still um, at this point far away from like this being mainstream. It is common, but not as mainstream. Okay. But concretely, you might ask like, what does this actually mean? Uh, and how does this help us to answer sort of like oh, a key question here, which is, well, you know, why should you contribute to open source? Um, well, what's important to understand about all of this information is we in a very different context today, right? As I said, software is now everywhere. Open source is completely mainstream. Um, it's been widely adopted and used by corporations. Again, this is new, right? And comparatively, we have a much, much, much bigger and a lot more diverse population of developers right now. Um, and so I, I see Todd uh, uh, in, in the, hi Todd, uh, in the chat. Um, so we have, um, you know, we're talking about 20 plus million um, developers today, um, which is growing, right? 
Um, and the other aspect also, which I think is a really interesting one and an important one, is that open source is increasingly getting professionalized, right? So, for example, and that's sort of like an extreme example, but this is not uncommon across large open source projects, 93% of contributions to the, uh, to the Linux kernel um, in, I think, 20, 2017 uh, were done by um, contributors who are being paid to do that, right? So we are very, very far away. It's a very, very distinct and different um, uh, environment than the early days of open source, right? And hence, this new context means new additional motivations, right? People will not want to do open source and corporations will not invest in open source today for the same reasons that they did before, right? Or not only for those reasons. And what's important is that, you know, this doesn't invalidate initial motivations, right? It adds to them and adds this new panel of reasons why people may want to choose to invest in open source as a career move, et cetera. Um, and so it's important also to understand that the initial motivations aren't necessarily shared by everyone anymore, right? Um, and not only is it important to understand that, but also to accept that this is okay. This is um, a normal thing that happens when something moves from being extremely niche um, in a very tight knit um, community uh, uh, that you know that is uh, heterogen uh, homogeneous, um, and as it moves into mainstream, becomes a lot more heterogeneous. You will see that kind of of changes, right? Um, and lastly, and I think that's a really important thing is um, we can today because we understand better the benefits of open source and how we can benefit both individuals and uh, organizations. Um, we can be more intentional about why we invest our time and our resources um, in open source, right? If we understand the why, uh, we uh, can, um, you know, defend and make it, it's easier to justify actually the involvement and the investment. Um, and as a result, and I think that's particularly important right now, it makes open source a lot more sustainable, right? If you can articulate the reason why as a developer or as an organization, you want to be invested um, in open source, you want to invest in it, you want to be involved, it's way easier to defend uh, spending 20% of your time doing that or, uh, you know, uh, upstreaming that, that, that fix that you, that you did in your fork or doing all of the related work. Um, so let's dig into today's uh, motivations for both individuals and organizations. I'm going to start with individuals first. Um, but to get us there, um, I want us to look at a funny um, graphic uh, process diagram that you've probably seen in a t-shirt somewhere in the past. So this is a really basic um, process diagram, which basically describes the input and output of an engineer, right? As input, you have a problem and coffee. As output, you have a solution and you get a byproduct, which is sarcasm. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing people laugh. Yes, this is very accurate. I agree. I love this diagram. Um, so, you know, changing that from an engineer to a software engineer basically implies essentially um, you know, that the solution, right, uh, becomes, that used to be just a solution, like now is more specific, it's code. Um, and if we now add a, the pool of commons uh, to this equation, right, um, basically where all of, well, you know, all open source software is, we see uh, that this, you know, this engineer starts contributing to that uh, pool of common instead, right? So, so far, this is very similar to the original diagram. Nothing much has changed. What's really interesting, however, is when a second engineer shows up and also starts contributing to the same pool of commons, right? They start having interactions. Um, and those interactions can take many forms. Um, you know, they might start by uh, just someone might start by just finding an issue on, on GitHub, right? 
um, or maybe uh, sending a pull request, reviewing a pull request, right? Uh, maybe uh, someone will then join a mailing list or a, a chat uh, and start having conversations there. Um, and you know, as these conversations evolve, uh, you will start to see um, maybe things like mentoring coming up. Um, and through events like this one, um, or you know, other online events, uh, or in uh, different times, uh, physical ones, uh, people will start to network, get connected to one another, um, and sort of like build this um, you know additional layer of things happening on top of their original strictly software engineering work, right? And what's really interesting and really important is that contrary to what would happen if this was two developers from the same company contributing to the same code base, um, it is very possible and oftentimes the case that those two people interacting here, or well, you know, the multitude of people interacting on a given piece of software have extremely different motivations, come from extremely different backgrounds, um, will have really different requirements from uh, the same piece of software, have a different understanding of technology, maybe a different culture, maybe speak a different language. Um, and all of this is incredibly interesting because it creates uh, you know, a, a slew of different um, contexts and um, use cases that the original software engineer by themselves could not have imagined or thought of. So, um, remember that I, I talked about these, uh, you know, the, the sarcasm as a byproduct, right, beforehand. And of course, that was jokingly, but it wasn't only jokingly. Um, all of this, these interactions, all of, you know, the code reviewing, the mentoring, the networking, all of these interactions happening are also themselves a vector of byproducts, right? Um, and here's just like um, a number of them, right? Uh, you know, for example, like um, um, le leveling up engineers, right? I mean, if you participate to an open source project, you will learn a lot from it. Um, improving soft skills, uh, improving culture, adopting best practices, better code quality, right? Oh, there's like plenty of those. Uh, and what's interesting is that we can actually sort of like group them together um, in a way that um, helps us um, think about them uh, um, in a more sort of practical way uh, that we can leverage better, right? Um, and uh, here we have um, four categories, uh, project level, individual level, uh, team level, and organizational level um, byproducts of uh, participating and being part of this open source culture. I'm coming to I'm coming to uh, the GitHub on your uh, resume uh, story. Uh, so let's I'm um, seeing someone in, in the chat mention that. And yes, I agree. Um, let's get into the um, uh, let, let's focus first on individuals. Right. Um, and sorry. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned leveling up engineers is a key one here, right? And I think it's kind of uh, obvious why, like you actually learn from practicing with people that are really good at the particular software you're working on. Adopting best practices, improving soft skills, this is something that you get to do um, in open source really, really well that is not necessarily something that you get to do at work. At work, when you have a problem, when you have a conflict with a coworker, or a um, you know someone from a, a different organization inside of your own company, it's really easy just to go talk to your manager and get managers to fix the problem, right? In open source, you cannot do that. If someone's gatekeeping, if someone's in your way, if someone's um, being problematic, or if you're the being the problematic person, because you know that happens too, right? Um, you have to figure out how to fix that using soft skills. Um, because there's, you have no leverage over this other um, uh, developer uh, or engineer that's working on this project. Of course, um, you know, as I mentioned, you get access to an expert network and you get better career opportunities. Let's get into that. Open source is a clear career booster. Like I own my whole career to open source, right? And a lot of other people do too. And uh, you know, as Amy was saying on, on the chat, like your GitHub profile is your resume, 
Um, and so open source is a great, great way to kickstart and level up your career. Um, there's data around this from a, a GitHub uh, survey um, where um, over half of the respondents uh, that were um, open, you know, working on open source software claimed that open source was somewhat or very important in getting their current role. Um, but as you can imagine, this also comes with um, some issues. Um, and um, it, you know, this system inherently favors people that are privileged to be able to spend time on open source outside of their work, right? So I'll get to that uh, really shortly. Uh, but before I want to mention um, two things that people some people in corporations actually sometimes do um, that uh, was the hope of um, taking a short a career shortcut right um, is to sort of like dress up their um, op op their resume with open source contributions that are not like really open source contributions it, it, it's such um, a common thing that. Um, companies that um, um, deal with um, uh, recruiting uh, uh, even handle this. Like they know they look at GitHub uh, re, um, uh, um, profiles and they will know right away. Oh, this is a profile that was essentially built uh, to pretend that the person has open source uh, contributions, right? So you have to commit to open source. Like it, it can't be something that you do sort of like um, it, just to get. To short, you know, to to short circuit your your, your way to to um, a, a better position, you really have to do it seriously. Um, and the other aspect is also you don't want to be opportunistic about it. Um, there are companies in um, um, in tech today that will sort of send their junior engineers to work on open source projects uh, with the hope that they will, uh, as a result, get sort of like free education. Um, and as soon as those um, uh, you know new recruits, junior engineers are sort of savvy enough to get their ways around an open source project, uh, they're then moved back into closed proprietary stuff inside of the company, right? So, I mean, obviously, like word gets around pretty quickly of practices like this, and it's never like um, it, it's it never pays in the long run, right? So um, I want to now address the, the problem of um, privilege in open source, right? Basically, in, in, a, in, a, in, in um, a nutshell, um, as, as long as open source was essentially something that people did as a hobby or as outside of their job, um, it was essentially something that people that didn't have... Um, uh, that had the time to do that could, right? So, you know, typically care is something that is uh, still predominantly done by women. Um, you find a lot of students that um, have to work through their studies to actually pay for their studies in their living, right? That didn't have the time and still don't have the time to be able to spend uh, time building an open source portfolio. And so uh, that creates, um, uh, if, you, if you put that in, in the, and you add to that, that open source really is a carrier booster, right? So you can, uh, you can see how this lack of access uh, to open source just for lack of time, right? Um, inc increases the discrepancy in who gets the good jobs in open source. Right, um, and you know, tech is sorry. In tech, and tech is already a field where we have very clear. Uh, yes, there are some data points on on this. I, I won't be able to share them here, um, but uh, um, you know, clearly, GitHub survey um, shows uh, that. Um, well, first of all, open source is um, um, beneficial um, to uh, carry to your career, right? And secondly, that uh, it's actually worse. Uh, the the divide is worse. Like I I think like there's roughly about twenty percent women in tech, for example. Um, and I think in open source it's like three or five or something like really really low. Um, and so uh, actually I wrote an article on this topic like a while back. I link it in the chat later on. Um, so you know the question then becomes 
um, if what can you do uh, about this? Um, and so what's interesting is companies can actually really help. And one of the key way of helping is to professionalize open source, right? The more people do open source on their job, uh, the um, better chances uh, they have of participating in the community and um, getting the um, um, benefiting from it as a result, right? Uh, if you have a stronger network, um, if you've improved your own skills, uh, this will get you um, in a better position. Secondly, one of the things that companies can do is proactively help underrepresented minorities contribute, right? Uh, so um, make sure that everyone uh, on your team gets to contribute and not just the people that are used to doing so, right? Because they will, in general, skew uh, to um, young white male, for example, right? And lastly, you want to have their back, right? Um, um, there's a lot of horrible stories in open source about um, contribute, contributors uh, being harassed uh, for their gender and for their race. Uh, there's a lot, there's a data that shows, uh, for example, that um, women contributing to open source uh, when they're using a female name tend to have their code uh, uh, less um, merged into the main branches than when they're using a male name. So, you know, there's a lot of data that shows that, like, it is not the easiest um, uh, place for uh, women and minorities, right? Um, and one of the really good things that you can do here is invest in proper policy to protect your um, contributors. Um, one of the things that I really like, I think it's Zalando who did that. They actually wrote a, I can link to that too, actually. Um, there's, um, uh, Zalando did um, a whole policy that um, basically creates um, a, a context, in, what helps con their own employees who are being harassed or uh, suffering a code of conduct violations in uh, external um, uh, open source projects. Okay, so I see like there's like so much like going on in the chat about this. I see that this is a hot topic. So I hope we can actually like ask, you know, uh, discuss this a bit more at the end of the, of the talk, right? And the question is, what do companies actually get out of helping with this? Well, um, one of the really good things that they get out of it is just like they increase diversity at every rung of the career ladder, right? If open source is a career booster, then helping minorities get into open source will help them climb the career ladder. And so you won't end up in these uh, situations where all of the diversity is within junior members. Um, uh, secondly, well, that's gonna help uh, decrease the wage gap. A lot of the wage gap is due to, um, um, uh, um, sorry, I'm, I'm looking for the words here, but basically um, it, it's due to uh, the career ladder, right? Um, um, better paid, higher up jobs being essentially uh, owned by, um, well, have skewing towards uh, white males, right? Um, and finally, um, you know, actually uh, this, just building the, a structure for, to make sure that everyone in your company can and is encouraged to contribute to open source um, and is um, helped to do so, will build a stronger open source culture. So that's a benefit too. All right, um, so then that we've sort of addressed um, the benefits for individuals, I'd like to get into the benefits for companies and organizations in general, right? There are three um, um, sort of like key benefits here. Um, the first one is the ones that we're looking at before, which is second order or um, byproducts uh, benefits, right? The second one is operational benefits. And lastly, we have strategic benefits. Let's get into second order benefits. Uh, so byproducts. Uh, what the Apache Foundation calls community over code, right? which is a concept that I really, really like. So going back um, to the, our, bar, our bar products and focusing now um, on more on the team and organization level, right? Of course, the project level, when you open source a project, um, it tends to create a whole bunch of benefits around documentation, quality, um, you know, lower technical depth, et cetera, right? Uh, which are essentially due to um, you, like a forcing function to actually do the work. So th that's well documented, well understood. Uh, what is less so are um, the benefits of open source for teams and for organizations. For teams, 
Um, uh, what's interesting is uh, how it creates increased efficiencies for teams. Uh, so there is um, data from a research by Frank Nagel um, for the Harvard Business um, uh, Review, uh, which is based on research that he did. He wrote an article called Learning by Contributing in 2017, um, where he analyzed um, about 60 or 70 firms um, that were building software on top of the Linux kernel about half of which were actively contributing to the Linux kernel and half of which were not. It turns out that the companies that were building on top of the Linux kernel um, were um, twice as effective doing so. They were producing twice more value um, out of um, uh, that work um, than um, those that were uh, basically free writing on the work of others. And what's fascinating is he actually goes, um, Frank Nagel actually goes into um, the reason behind this. Um, and that's why his article is called Learning My Contributing. And he outlines two key reasons, right? The first, obviously, is the network that you built when you contribute. And when you think about it, if you're an open source practitioner, um, if you've worked on a project, you know the people in the project, right? You know who owns what part of the project. Uh, you know if, and even if you don't, you know how to get to that person. That person's that person knows who you are, and as a result, when you email them um, on a uh, you know midday because you, you bumped into this weird bug, they will get. Um, back to you really, really quickly because they know you, they trust you, uh, they know that you've done the, you know, the due diligence to make sure that the bug wasn't something silly that you did. And as a result, you can unlock uh, a, a problematic uh, situation with the software that you're relying on way faster because you know who to talk to, right? Um, so, you know, typically this kind of thing that would take someone that doesn't know at all how the project works works, maybe like a week to solve is like an email and half an hour of wait. Um, secondly, the other aspect is that by going through the process of contributing and getting your code reviewed, what you're essentially doing, right, is getting trained by the people that are the best in the world on that software. Right? Uh, you get the actual inventors of a piece of software or like close contributors um, look at your code uh, and make, you know, suggest changes, explain to you why some of the decisions you made, when the right ones, et cetera, right? So this is kind of like being taught for free by the best people in the world whose time you can't buy anyway and who are actually probably working on the clock of your uh, own company's uh, competi competition, right? So it's this uh, in incredible way of actually really improving the quality of your team. Um, at the corporate level, um, there's, um, well, you know, following up from that is access to talent pool, right? Uh, it's uh, common knowledge now in the industry, in the tech industry at least, that um, getting, um, having a really good open source culture is key to getting, um, uh, to being attractive to uh, top engineering talent, right? Um, and as a data point, um, at Facebook, uh, now a number of years ago, probably seven or eight years ago at this point, uh, when Facebook wasn't suffering at all from some of the privacy um, um, issues that it had in the meantime, when it was still, you know, this hot startup um, in Silicon Valley that was going to um, uh, IPO, uh, that was solving really interesting engineering challenges, um, new recruits uh, still, for you know, three quarters of new recruits still actually had accepted their offer also because of, uh, you know, of, of Facebook's open source program, right? So it was a key reason to actually accept their offer. So again, uh, you know, a very common benefit, um, uh, side benefit of having a strong open source culture, right? Um, and the last one I want to get into uh, is being perceived as an industry leader, um, which is uh, also something that's really uh, common as a result of uh, getting in involved in open source. Um, and I have a really sweet example of that, which is the company Trivago. Trivago is a European um, company that um, um, is sort of like a, um, a booking.com competitor. Um, it um, essentially uh, organizes traveling, right? Um, and so 
a few years back, it was relying a lot on, on Webpack, um, or it probably still is, which is a, a library to sort of like handle all of your front end dependencies. And they wanted work to get to be um, improved on Webpack, which is an open source project. And so they decided to sponsor uh, the project to try to get the one of the main maintainers to actually implement a number of things that they wanted to. And so they gave, I think, $100,000 over the course of a year to the project. And so what's really interesting is not only did they get the work that they wanted done uh, and done at a quality level at which they couldn't have aspired to and for a cost that was way under what they would have had to pay for had they had um, built that in-house, trained someone, et cetera, right? But what's really interesting is as a result of this investment in the sponsoring of that project, they became perceived in the front-end JavaScript community as a friend of open source in Europe. And they started to get lots of software engineers banging on the door was like really good credentials asking for a job at their company, right? So that was a, you know, a huge benefit uh, for that company that was completely unexpected. All right, let's get into operational benefits uh, quickly um, uh, because we're running out of time. Um, there are um, uh, a number, a very common one, obviously, is if you know, that motivates companies to get more involved in open source um, is to start paying back technical debt. Maintaining forks of software that you patch every time there's a release is um, a lot of work, a lot of pain, um, doesn't always work the way it should and tends to create security issues because you can't, uh, you can't um, um, downstream uh, uh, patches as quickly as you want because the conflict was yours. Um, and so you start delaying stuff. You know, so it is um, a huge problem to have. Um, uh, you're much better off um, upstreaming your software. Um, that creates a ton of benefit for you as a company, but obviously for the community that benefits from your improvements. Another one is economic incentives, right? Um, the classic story here is web browsers where you see that um, the, the level of complexity and the size of browsers um, have essentially made everyone move over the course of the years around the same code base. Um, it would be extremely hard today to build a browser from scratch, probably completely impossible um, and meet all of the requirements um, um, that you would have to. So relying on existing software and contributing back to it is actually the, the best way forward for a whole bunch of companies operating in that space. Um, another really interesting aspect of an, another interesting benefit of open source um, is um, that um, you can actually uh, create a whole ecosystem. When Facebook launched React, um, it launched the main piece of software, React, but also uh, a number of papers that sort of like reference implementations for other pieces of software, which were really quickly picked on by other people in the community and built as separate um, um, projects, right? Um, and ended up being adopted by, React, by Facebook because they were just better. Right? So that helped uh, Facebook uh, sort of like build this whole ecosystem that they could rely on that didn't have to build um, themselves. And also, obviously, then they started hiring from these projects. Um, and uh, I want to quickly get into strategic benefits. Um, so um, if, if you've paid any attention to the cloud wars that are happening right now, you will see that um, uh, um, cloud um, providers are competing for developer mind share, right? And so one of the best ways to do that um, is um, obviously to, um, uh, well, show develop, let developers use tools for free. So open source is a great way of doing that. Uh, show developers that you're involved in the community, help developers, um, uh, and, and open source developers in particular, um, uh, was uh, their open source projects. And that's when you start to realize why it made complete sense for Microsoft to purchase GitHub, uh, for IBM to purchase Red Hat. It's really all about getting this mind share um, because once developers adopt a technology because they, there was the technology that they were running their tests, test suites on, for example, uh, for their open source projects, 
uh, they will know the technology better and tend to adopt it at project, you know, projects that they do at work as well, right? Um, another very common strategy too um, is what's called a commoditizing your complement. Uh, the idea here um, is that in, in, um, when you're building um, uh, software, or um, it, it's easier in a better position if what your software relies on itself is open source, right? If you're building a service, um, uh, if, if the service on which it's, if the solution that's underneath is open source um, and not, doesn't is not owned by a single uh, entity you're in a much better position not only because your market will be bigger but also because that entity cannot sort of suddenly um well, you know take the rug from underneath you so examples of that if you look at google google's focus is on search right and search is essentially um a way uh, like how search works from a financial perspective is you get people to come and search and look at the ads and the ads pay for all of the work, right? So what you want is a streamlined way to bring people to uh, actually search. Um, and hence, uh, it's un not surprising that Google invested both in uh, the, uh, you know, an open source browser and an open source operating system because both of those make it really easy for them to build on top of that. Similarly, Intel, who is actually a chip manufacturer, uh, uh, decided to, you know, the, the complement is the operating system, right? And so that's why Intel is the biggest contributor to um, Linux. Red Hat, which is essentially building services on top of, and, and selling services um, on top of um, Linux, is unsurprisingly the second biggest contributor. Um, and uh, the final example is an interesting one. It's, it's Facebook, right? If you think about Facebook, Facebook's job is essentially um, to uh, data mine information to then be able to target advertising, right? And the essential cost center that uh, Facebook has as a result of that, besides their workforce, is their data centers. Um, and so what they, Facebook do, it invested in a project called the Open Compute Project, which is essentially open hardware, uh, not only for servers themselves, but also for um, data centers, right? Um, and by open sourcing and providing all of this um, uh, intellectual property for free, uh, it has leveled the field of um, companies building hardware um, and so as a result, cut down costs quite a bit. I think like two or three years after uh, Facebook started that project, they had already um, uh, saved $2 billion, so billion was a B, um, on operating costs. And a few, it, it was like uh, a double digit uh, billion figure a few years after. So, you know, a, a massive cost saving um, um, uh, strategy uh, by relying on open source. And with that, uh, I'm at the end of this talk. Uh, I will uh, share the slides. I think the slides are already should already be up uh, on that link. Um, and uh, we have um, uh, some time for questions. So uh, let me get into the R up. Okay, wonderful, cool. Uh, I've also promised uh, that I would be sharing um, uh, a few um, uh, articles and I will do that. Um, so uh, let me sort of like scroll back up in the questions. I saw like lots of activity around this. Uh, so going back to... Uh, Yeah, so uh, Debbie uh, mentioned that um, you know on on the GitHub is your profile um, uh, aspect that uh, not only do um, companies do that, but um, companies also review a whole bunch of other things, uh, or at least like uh, her company does, which I think is great, and which I hope I would hope more companies uh, did. Right? Um, um, and 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 yes, like um, the fact that GitHub is your resume is not necessarily a good thing. Um, uh, it, it has issues, as I mentioned, right? But it is nonetheless a fact. So it's something that as a practitioner, uh, you want to consider as, in, as a, you know, a, a job seeker, this is something that's important and that you want to consider. 
so there were uh, questions around uh, a sp uh, uh, data points um, on the, the privilege issues that I just mentioned right now. Again, uh, I will share what I have uh, in this chat as soon as I find the article uh, on this topic. Uh, yes, again, um, mentioning that um, um, open source is more than just direct contributions to code 100%, right? Uh, I actually started my career in open source by documenting um, uh, an, op an open source JavaScript library that I was using, um, and that's how I learned to code, right? I wanted to use that thing, and I looked at the code, and that's how I learned how code worked. And so, uh, um, you know, it was incredibly valuable to me. It was incredibly valuable to the project, and it was um, a great start to my career. So, you know, absolutely, code is not the only thing. And documentation is one, but there's lots of others, right? Uh, managing the community is another, marketing. I mean, you have plenty of ways that you can contribute to projects. Uh, yes, uh, some people uh, um, uh, mentioning that uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, uh, a shame that uh, sexism is a thing. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I'm sorry to sort of um, word it that way. Um, but yes, um, it is uh, extremely unfortunate, uh, but it is a, a reality of, well, you know, the world we live in in general, but tech in particular, and at least uh, we can try to do something here. So again, I insist on the benefits for companies of making sure that um, if they're building an open source culture and want their um, uh, engineers to contribute, making sure that all of them get to do that and all of them feel safe doing so is, is super important. Um, yeah, some people bring ageism up. I mean, this is um, um, an issue, um, both for um, older developers, uh, but also for younger ones, right, uh, that are um, not taken seriously. Um, uh, older developers tend to uh, see their pay decrease as they age unless they take more managerial uh, tracks, uh, which is not the case everywhere, but you know um, it happens. So this is also a concern. Um, Amy bringing up the fact that companies need to know that it requires a lot of effort to contribute to open source. Yes, there is no free lunch, right? Uh, but there are huge benefits out of it. Um, yeah, uh, Luna mentioning, uh, I think Trivago contributing to uh, funding other open source efforts uh, and that they still do. Yes, uh, Trivago actually not only, uh, it's really interesting, not only do they continue um, to uh, fund other efforts, but they actually have their own, oh, had, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, like everything is sort of upside down now. So it's kind of weird to talk about this but uh, they had their own open source conference. So they, they found so much value in it that they really decided to double down. Um, thank you, Josh. Uh, I hope this helps. This helped. Um, you, know, you can look at some of my other talks um, um, make the argument more clearly for the business case of open source. Uh, there's like some overlap with this talk, but I think this, um, this could, uh, help. Yeah. Debbie brings up the fact that open source doesn't mean necessarily supported, maintained, or has a great community, right? So this is also, uh, something that's, um, uh, a skill that you sort of like learn when you start use, relying on open source as an engineer is to figure out, well, will the open source project that I want to rely on now be around in two or three years? Um, yes, more, uh, you know, more comments about uh, community being important. Um, of course, like, uh, you know, as uh, the Apache um, um, sort of like tagline, uh, community over code, right? Um, um, I think that's that's critical. Um, I don't know if you might have, uh, you might have been aware uh, a while ago, um, uh, GitHub decided to store sort of like a copy of all of the repositories and like a vault, like somewhere in the Arctic Sea or something like that. 
And I mean, of course, that was like a PR stunt, right? And everybody talked about it, and it was a great PR stunt, and people, you know, and, and sure. Uh, but but what's uh, what I thought was, um, you know, sending the really wrong message is like that code by itself, like even in two years, is probably like pretty hard to use, and probably doesn't make a lot more sense, right? Uh, however, the communities behind that code could probably rebuild a lot of this um, in a, in a short amount of time. So uh, I feel like there's. Um, there's, we don't insist on the community aspect of open source enough. Like clearly, um, it's at, it's at the center. Uh, it's the key to this practice, and which is, you know, I, I think it really shows when you look at um, um, you know the diagram around byproducts. Like all of those byproducts that are highly valuable are the effect of the community aspect of working on code together. Um, and so that's absolutely fundamental. Um, and, you know, if you have to, like, if there's one key takeaway um, of why you should do open source, it's because um, community, you know, the culture and the community of open source um, are like, um, you know, that's where the real value lies, right? So I'm, I'm looking back at the uh, chats and the comments there. So Debbie mentions beware.org uh, slash community, which I'm not familiar with. So I'll go check that out. Oh, Rob asks a really good question um, uh, about community for for much smaller projects well the community is not only the people contributing to the software it's broader than that um it's also the people using the software um the benefit of really small communities was really small uh, you know a, a software that addresses a niche um is that you can build sort of like a, a really product-like and really close relationship with the people actually using the software. Um, and, and that can uh, be really rewarding. So um, Rob, my answer to your question would be um, not to focus on, um, on community is only about the contributors, but being broader, right? Um, and, and, you know, some projects will have um, users of the projects, but then um, some projects can even have users um, of the output of the user of the project, right? If you consider, um, um, well, well, WordPress is a great example of that, right? Uh, I mean, um, WordPress it has like a community uh, building uh, WordPress, right? Um, and then it has a community um, building um, well, imp, um, 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 you know, building things with WordPress, right? Like websites. Um, and then it has a, a community of people actually consuming the content on those websites, right? And so, um, you know, like that's the case for a lot of communities where you have sort of like these sort of like, um, you know, circles, orbits um, around um, uh, the, the, central, the, the central project. All right, I, I think I, I ran through the chat. Um, um, uh, and I think that if there are no uh, questions left, uh, we should just call it a day. All right, well, in that case, um, thank you everyone uh, very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, and uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, you have my email, Twitter handle, uh, all the things if you want to discuss this further. Um, and I'll, um, I'll link um, in the chat here uh, the article I mentioned. Um, yeah, thank you all. I hope you this was useful to you and uh, looking forward to uh, the next sessions. Take care, people. Bye-bye.